patience, I think, of people who are thinking ahead and planning for the next generation. We didn't, in my opinion, have the patience in that particular thing. And it would present a very, very different scenario. Now, it's no secret, because you're all in business, and most of you are, that we're enduring some very, very difficult times. You know, when the man who wrote this city charter in 1916 uh, did it, we were just a tiny town. We were about 36,000 people. We only had one industry, essentially. One industry. It was a very industry in many, way, in many ways. It had great entrepreneurs in it. But we were a one industry town. Now, those were tough times and tough challenges. You know, going through the 30s and getting into a little bit more current history, incredibly tough times for this town. You know, it's a time when it was chronicled very well by our friend Harry Farrell and Swift Justice when one savage act of kidnapping and murder of Brooke Park could turn the placid business community into a raving lynch mob, into an absolute transitional change because things were never quite the same after that event in 1933. And it really transfixed our city. The Depression went on, and we all know we came out of the Depression here and nationally by a great war. Uh, a war where uh, many refer to it as the Good War. It's a little bit of a, a mixed terminology, but I think most of you understand what that means when you say a good war. You know, you had people that were so involved in, in that here, those young men who went through the Depression and then they went off. Ken Machado Sr. won the Silver Star in an approach into Germany. Carlos Ogden won the Medal of Honor outside Sherbrooke. But most of the individuals just did what they had to do, and then they came back here. You know, Jack Barrico and Russ Rossner, and people you know very well, Jerry Rosenbaum. They came back and they built a life here. Uh, there was one haberdasher on uh, South First Street named Leon Jacobs. I think a few people in here may have uh, known him. Uh, he's been dead for some time. His son was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. So some people sacrificed tremendously in very, very tough times. But then they came back, assembled their life, put one foot ahead of the other, which is really the San Jose tradition, and went back in that period, 1945 <coughs> through the early 50s, to build the city again. Up the road at the farm, there was a professor named Frederick Turman, who had a couple of uh, protégés named Dave and Bill, who came up with the idea, it was fairly uh, uh, revolutionary, of a Stanford business park. We would have those relationships uh, with business, with academia. And I think we all know the success and the result of that. Our city was about 90,000 people there. It was still really the same town after World War II in the 1950s as it was before. Surrounded by missions, I mean, surrounded by orchards, the old mission school in Santa Clara, of course, San Jose Strait, the state across the street here, producing tremendous numbers of business people and teachers. <coughs> and also the backbone of this new Silicon Valley. Then things really changed. The boom years of the 50s and the 60s really were probably a period of time like few communities have ever seen anywhere in the world before. And I like this reference. They said that the greatest piece of democratic art ever invented was the suburban ranch home. And we all know what it did to change our community. The greatest piece of democratic art, because it gave uh, all of those individuals who had fought in the war, the children of immigrants, the grandchildren of immigrants, all the people who had never been able to have the sliding glass door and the big backyard, all the things that really are the American dream, that was able to be fulfilled right here. And a lot of people like Steve Schott built many of those. Uh, the other thing that I think really came to tremendous fruition here in a, in a way that's been seen in other places, but I think was rather unique here, is that great misnomer of the mobile home. You know, Rudy Stedler and Lee Brandenburg built tens of thousands of these, and they're not very mobile, but they're wonderful homes. And again, for individuals that coming through the 19th century were either immigrants or they were renters, they were always trying to get their little piece of the earth. Well, they found it here in San Jose. You know, San Jose was a special place then, and the parallel that happened at the state level, which I think we have to be ever mindful of, was the ascent of Pat Brown to the governor's office. Um, he didn't directly succeed, but I think in a very uh, specific way, he succeeded another great governor named Earl Warren, who at one time was, was such a nonpartisan, he won both the Democratic and Republican primaries for governor. That's what you call having tremendous support. He ran the state just like individuals here were attempting to run the city. 
in a nonpartisan, uh, lack of acrimony. Uh, you have to build the state just like you have to build the state. You need new roads, you need educational institutions, you need a great water system. All the things that were looked at and done on the local level here were paralleled by Pat Brown in Sacramento. And it was a golden period for the state. A tremendous golden period. Kevin Starr in his eight volumes, uh, really the preeminent historian in California, chronicles it so well, and I really advise you to pick up his latest volume, The Golden, the Golden State of California, and, and look at what he says about San Jose and what happened in that period of time. Because looking back and understanding history, it's successes and failures, but particularly in times like this, it's successes. I think it's very important. Very important to understand that when you go through tough times, putting one foot ahead of the other is difficult, but very important. You know, all the success that I'm chronicling now that happened in San Jose, I didn't come without uh, tremendous pain. You know, I call it Katrina time in San Jose, 1958 to 1978, when the downtown just basically disappeared. You know, that may not mean a lot to people who don't understand that it was the, the lives and entrepreneurship of a lot of small business people that maybe they've been building for three or four generations. It changed just in the flickering of an eye. Let me give you an example. Uh, I won't tell you about Hearts and Gales and the movie theaters and Bob Coyle and Norman Dins and all, they were all here, but let's put it in the present day reference. What if Valley Fair, Santana Road, all the movie theaters of uh, the uh, Century area, all the car dealerships of Capitol Expressway and Stephen Street Boulevard, they all disappeared. It would be the most incredible body blow that any community could absorb. And we absorbed that here. We absorbed it, and to add insult to injury, the newspaper and city hall left also. Uh, it really the unkindest cut of all when even your political leadership uh, kind of pulls the flag down and, and heads out of town. So remembering those hips of history, I think, is very important. And remembering those can sometimes help you from making the same mistake twice. You know, in the late 70s, things began to change a little bit. And uh, a mayor that I don't think gets anywhere near enough credit, Janet Gray Hayes, uh, went from uh, trying to get a stop light at Trace School over on Nagley to becoming the first woman mayor of a major American city. Uh, pretty incredible, uh, particularly when uh, a noted Rotarian named Joe George Starver spoke to this group in 1972 and said, and, and I will quote him, a dark cloud descended on our city. A woman was elected to the city council. <laughs> Now, George may have had his tongue firmly planted in his cheek, but uh, maybe he didn't. He gave that speech, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful speech. It really tells a lot about what I'm saying today. I plagiarized it pretty broadly in some of my earlier comments, but that was, a, a, was really a tectonic change in the way the city was run. When I said those first men set up the city charter, that's what I meant, those first men. And city councils were predominantly men, totally men, until the 60s. When I became mayor, uh, San Jose was about 670,000 people. Uh, we were about 160 square miles, and seven of the council members were women. Now, uh, I, I think somewhat subjectively that during those eight years, we kind of moved the city ahead pretty well. Seven of the ten council members were women. Now, that could have happened if seven of the ten were men, but given the testosterone levels, I don't think it would have. You know, I think you can very clearly point to the McHenry piece that if you would have had a majority of women, with of men rather than women on city council, that we wouldn't have had kind of a simple, straightforward, one foot ahead of the other, don't worry about the personal vendettas and the acrimony, try to move the city ahead. And I believe that happened in a fairly significant way. Of course, I speak only as a historian here today. Um, the mayorships of uh, Janet Gray Hayes and myself and my successor, Susan Hammer, we may not have did everything right, and certainly I made any number of mistakes, but we did have a set agenda that was embraced pretty broadly by people in the San Jose community. One other thing that the government of Sacramento under Pat Brown or Earl Warren had in common with what we were doing here in San Jose, and that was the very elusive in the current day terminology, they had the trust and confidence of the people. People really felt that no matter what kind of crazy mistakes you might make on an occasional Tuesday or an occasional decision, but these were good people in office and they were people who were 
try and move the city 